Um, thank you, Jabulani. Um, yeah, I've, sure, now I see what people are talking about. Um, so I've tried to, to simplify my, my title a little bit. Um, I'm Isaac Smith, as I was just introduced. I live in Skakuza in the Kruger National Park, not just for three months, but mostly for 11 months of the year. Um, but it's great to be here, and I um, decided to not talk about Kruger today to you guys, but to talk about some of the thinking that's been going in in some of our smaller national parks. Um, and that is in terms of our integrated herbivore removal decision making. So I don't think I need to preach to this group in terms of why we need to do herbivore removals in small protected areas. I think we're all familiar with that, that if you put a fence around it, you immediately exclude certain processes happening in these parks, like migration in and out of those areas. You also don't have the full her um, predator guild there. You change the predator-prey relationships. And because of these missing ecological processes, you quite often get um, fell degradation if you don't manage your herbivore populations. And that's sort of on the one side of it. Um, then I put that next bullet there because I was paying attention yesterday about the biodiversity economy. So this also presents us some opportunities to be part of this um, wildlife economy and in terms of revenue generation for, for managing our parks. So in terms of herbivore removals in sand parks, we've got our big, our large, what we call processed parks like Kruger and the Kalahari, where predation and migration and movements are still um, to some degree intact. So we do minimal herbivore um, interventions there. Um, we also have other um, parks, but we don't have many large mammals. We don't really need to intensively remove the one elephant in the Garden Route National Park. So we, we've got some of those parks, but actually most of our parks in sand parks, we need to actively manage the, the herbivore um, numbers, or at least think about it actively. So what happens is each park um, every year writes a proposal that goes to the um, uh, Wildlife Management Committee meeting in sand parks. It's a bit like our own little CITES, um, where they then basically approve or ask for more information in terms of herbivore management in our smaller parks. I'm just talking today about herbivore removals, but they also discuss um, reintroductions um, or introductions if some of the species has sort of fallen into a predator trap or something like that. Just to give you some context of how our thinking have changed um, in sandbox over the past couple of years, our historical paradigm was, I suppose, what would have been described by Samantha on the first day as a simplistic and a linear view of the world, where you would have your um, fixed stocking rates. It's quite nice. You've got your line. You go, you fly, you count, you see how many animals you get. You use a calculator, you subtract, and you know how many animals are surplus and that can be removed. So that's what we did for a lot of years. It was a simplistic view of the world and it was quite nice because everyone could, could get their heads around it. But it ignores spatiotemporal variabili variability. If you think about the Karoo parks that we manage, you had these boom and bust cycles in these parks and now suddenly we say constant, 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 which is highly un, um, uh, unnatural and it suppresses fluxes. And I think we've moved away from this sort of more agricultural view of the world and ecology and conservation are parting in some, some respects. Um, and there's also the arbitrary assignment of species to different feeding guilds in this um, paradigm. So then this, the scientists in Sandbox started thinking about new ways of thinking about it and we, um, our current paradigm is to embrace spatial temporal variability and also not looking at the animal numbers, but looking at the role of the animals, of the herbivores in the park, and looking at the impact of the animals. So you can think about bush encroachment, you can think about the loss of tall trees, you can think about the creation of um, grazing lawns, etc. So some positive and some potentially negative effects of herbivores in these parks. Um, and if you think about it, you might have certain years where it's like very green and you had high rainfall, so you can have high herbivore numbers and it wouldn't really have such a big impact. But other years you might have lower animal densities, but uh, you're going through a drought period and that's when the animals would have moved out of the park potentially. So then lower numbers can actually be more detrimental than higher numbers in other years. So we were quite excited about our new approach. 
But what happened is we had this new approach, but we had no way to deal with our new approach. So we would go to our managers and we would tell them all the stuff about complexity and embracing spatial temporal variability and fluxes and so forth. And they would, they would not, and they would be, okay, okay, we, we, we hear what you say, we buy it. And then they would say, so should we remove herbivores this year? If yes, how many and of which species? And then the scientists are a bit annoyed by that answer. But really, if you're a manager, that is what it boils down to. Um, I remember once going out into the field with managers, and it was a lot of fire ecologists, and we had all these nice, robust academic discussions in the felt. And then the ranger came to me and he said, so should we burn or should we not burn? Okay. And, and I think we really need to come out of this complexity mode into a requisite or um, profound simplicity in terms of helping our managers to, to manage the parks. Um, so if you're the manager of Golden Gate National Park, this is actually in South Africa, this is not the Serengeti. Um, unfortunately, you can't get there with the tourist roads, we call it the Little Serengeti. Um, and if you're the manager of Golden Gate National Park and you see all these blessed park running around, this is a pretty good question to ask. Should we remove or not? So we realized that we need to really come up with an integrated decision-making system in, in these parks, um, where we integrate both the animal aspect and the plant um, response to it. We need to in, um, integrate the scientist perspectives and the management perspective. So it's not the scientists telling the managers what to do or waiting for the managers to tell us what they are doing. Um, also, uh, taking um, into account both qualitative and quantitative approaches. I like numbers, I like Excel spreadsheets, but the more and more I work in these complex socio-ecological systems, the more I realize how much information is in the qualitative, um, and that one really needs to take that into consideration as well when you make decisions. Um, we've got field data, but then, as Jolene introduced on the first day, there's new incredible technology in terms of remote sensing, so we should also integrate different sources of, um, of information. And then, I don't quite know what to call it, but I talked about soft opinions and hard models, okay? And I think um, we need to integrate both of that as well. So translating that a little bit into what's the information layers that we need to, uh, to get these integrated decision-making framework, um, we've come up with the following information sources that now go into our herbivore removal decision-making. You can see them listed there, and then on the right-hand side, you can see it's sort of animals and plants, and science and management and field and remote sensing, hard and soft, etc. Um, and I'm going to go through that in the next couple of slides in more detail. So population size and the five-year census trend and growth rate-based um, offtake models, that's sort of the herbivore side of it. Then field-based vegetation assessments as well as remote sensing vegetation assessments, the management recommendations, and then the narrative or the qualitative where you can talk about risks and logistics, etc. the stuff that you can't quite capture in, in numbers or in the scientific um, process. Okay, so if we go through some of it, um, some of it might seem very intuitive, but it's surprising how often it's not actually used in, in making decisions. So I think it's one thing to say you're doing it, but it's one thing to be quite explicit about it. So we look at the population size and the five-year census trend. So that's really, you can think if you've got the big population of a species in a certain park and the numbers are increasing, you might potentially consider them for removals. If you've got a small population or the population is declining, they're already responding to the environment or they're already capped by natural processes there or be because of the habitat, um, or they are in peril for another reason. So if your trend goes up, you might consider them for removal based on what the other information say, but if their numbers go down, you're not going to um, mess with them. Then we've got offtake models. This is sort of the, the statistical parts of it. I'm not putting any um, uh, formulas there. Um, and what we do, do here is we, put, we um, test various population growth models to the census data, and then we select the model that fits the best to our data. We work out the maximum sustainable yield, and then we've got this giga-giga factor. We divide it by two. Um, and then we sort of calculate what's the range of herbivores that you can potentially remove from the system. 
Um, I'm not going to go into the detail, but again, the interpretation is pretty simple. If you've got a positive growth rate um, and it's hi quite high, then you've got the higher proportion of animals that you can consider for removal. If it's low or negative, then you will probably not remove herbivores. So that's the animal part of it. Let me just show you an example. Okay, so, so here you can see this is um, in one of our sections of Addo Elephant National Park, the mountain zebra. You can see our census data there. We fit all these different models and we select the model that fits the best. You can see it fits pretty nicely to the data. A positive five-year census trend. And based on those statistical models, um, it's predicted that you can take off between eight and 15 individuals. If you look at in the same park, the springbok numbers, you fit the model, you can see it's acceptable to fit. It's got a negative growth rate um, in the past couple of years, so you won't consider any animals for removal. Then we also take into account the vegetation side of it. So we actually go out into the field. Um, you, do, um, you look at the biomass in the, in the area. You do look at the composition. So we use these disc pasture meters like Sandra is using here to look at the available biomass and you look at the composition, etc. And again, it's quite simplistic. Um, if the felt is in good condition, you probably won't remove herbivores, but if the felt is in a poor condition, the animals might have moved off. So you're trying to simulate these processes that would have, would have happened naturally in these systems. Sometimes we just don't have enough kilometers or time, and then we just get one of our expert vegetation ecologists that work in these different parks and different biomes to go and have a look at the field and at least gives us, give us a um, qualitative assessment. Okay, this is the remote sensing part. This is the part that I'm mostly involved with because this is really a collective. A lot of people feed information into this process where we use the MODIS Enhanced Vegetation Index to look at the vegetation greenness in these um, systems. And the data has been collected since, since 2000. And essentially what you do is you look at the vegetation greenness and biomass in the park. We need to make a decision and you compare it to the long-term average. Okay. So typically in a situation like this, you would, for example, consider herbivore removals because the animals would have moved off. Um, we're not doing um, large-scale um, reduction of animals in Kruger, but this is what Kruger looks like at the moment. It's, it's fascinating from a scientific perspective, and I don't say that to the media. <laughs> um, and, and this is what, what it can look like in, in different contexts. So typically, yeah, you would consider removals. Yeah, even if you have high numbers, why would you consider removals? Um, just to show you examples of what this looked like, um, this is Marakele, and this is the average vegetation greenness across the 18 years for which we've got data. Um, so above the line means above average, and below the line means below average conditions, vegetation greenness conditions. So what you can see is across this 18 years, the past year was actually the lowest um, average vegetation greenness that we've ever seen in the park. So potentially the animals would have moved out of the park, or you would have had high mortalities which we can then cash in on, literally speaking, um, by, by selling some of the animals. But what's quite nice about the remote sensing is the, that you get a spatially explicit picture of what's going on as well. So if you look at this, the gray means that pixel is within 5% of its long-term average greenness, and pink and red means it's below or far below average. Light green and dark green means it's above or far above average. So what you can see if you look at Marakele is that the west and the northwest is actually the areas where the vegetation is really experiencing far below average conditions. So the mountain lands, for those of you that know Marakele, you don't need to move animals out of there. It's pretty um, average, but it's actually in these areas where you need to focus your, your removals and you also know which species prefer these areas. So these are the areas where you would focus. If you look at Tankwa Karu National Park, you can see we've got some average, it's roughly average vegetation conditions and you've got a nice mixture of gray and green and red. So there's potentially no need for, for you to remove animals out of that system. But if you look at this, I think this was 2004, five and six, I can't see my own right, um, it's quite a bit small here. But during this period, 
you pro the animals would probably have moved off from Tangkwakaru, um, from that area, which is now fenced. So then essentially you might consider some herbivore removals at that stage. Then the two last layers that we need, to, that we include in our decision making is the management recommendations. So we've got some really experienced and really opinionated managers sometimes in some of our parks, which is a great asset and a great frustration sometimes if you, if you don't take time to listen to them. Um, so they often have their own models, okay, and we want to hear what their own models is telling us because we also feel that they've got a lot of um, experience in these parks. Here is one of our park managers that was highly experienced, um, um, Peter Bedet in Kamdabur National Park, and he's walking around there, and he used to say, I'm getting sweaty kneecaps, we need to remove herbivores, okay. So that's what I call the sweaty kneecaps test. If Peter Bedet gets sweaty kneecaps, he integrates a lot of information and a lot of experience and a lot of background when he comes up with sweaty kneecaps. So I think the sweaty kneecaps, some people call it the gut feel, etc. I think that's an incredible important information system that we need to embrace. And then sometimes um, the managers also have other management objectives that's not captured in the scientific um, data and processes. So we want to include that in the decision making as well. And then here is the narrative. This is one of my colleagues seeming to, to direct the, the blue wildebeest there. Um, and they also need to tell us sometimes, give us a bit of a reality check in terms of what we're saying. If we want to mobilize this whole operation to remove 20 wildebeest, they will say, listen, yeah, we're, not, we're not going out for that. Or if we say to them, you need to remove 2,000 springbok from the Karoo National Park, they also will tell us, you know, are you crazy? Um, so we need to look at the logistics, we need to look at the prices and the costs, we need to look at the risks, and we also look at the seasonal predictions for the coming season. So if you've had a far below average year, and the predictions are you're going to have another of those years, you might be more aggressive in your removals than when, um, when they're predicting um, average or above average conditions. So all of this goes into this report, and at the end of the report, you actually get this nice table that integrates all this information on one page, where you've got your different species as the different rows, and you've got your different variables that we've just discussed now as your different um, columns, okay. So there you will see the animals are there, the plants are there, the remote sensing is there, the field data is there, the management recommendations is there, the, um, um, all of those different layers are there, and there's the um, narrative as well. It's a bit small to see here. You don't need to worry about the details. And at the end, that is where we need to come out of this complexity and sort of end up with what's the recommendation. And here everyone gives, uh, this is sort of the recommendation then based on all this information. Um, and what we've seen is if you work from the left to the right hand side, there's sort of an answer that emerge based on all this information. You can see this population is increasing, the vegetation is in poor condition, etc. This is a species that is likely to be removed, etc. Um, I see that chairperson is standing up, so I'm going to finish off. Um, in terms of, uh, uh, and just conclude, um, I think this has given us a, a structured and a predictable process but yet with quite a lot of flexibility in terms of how you interpret it and what the decisions are that you, that you make. It embraces complexity, um, which we can't get away from, yet it provides a requisite simplicity. It does tell you how many wildebeest or blessbuck to remove from, from your park. It bridges the science management divide. This, we write a little report afterwards. And if you know the people in Sandbox, you'll see that there's a combination of scientists and managers. So people feel they, they all contribute and they're all part of it. So it's not like the scientists need to go and convince the managers or the managers need to push the arm of the scientists. We're all in it together. You get buy-in. Everyone feels their data is part of the decision-making process. So the remote sensor is happy, the field guy is happy, the plant guy is happy, the animal guy is ha happy, because they see their data there and they see it was part of the discussion. And it's quite nice when you see that there's this common theme developing. 
Um, it provides a platform for discussions. We've had some really interesting discussions about this. We usually have a science management forum where we get the scientists and the managers sitting together in a room looking at this stuff and saying, what are we going to experiment with now? What, are we ca what can we learn from this? Um, but once you've done it a couple of times, you can actually even start doing it by email because we spread over quite a wide area in South Africa. So to get the scientists and the managers all together is sometimes quite tricky. So um, once you know the format, you can even by email circulate the recommendations and get buy-in. Um, this seems like I'm a politician. It's transparent, it's systematic, inclusive, integrative, flexible, and defendable. Um, but I do think it does actually have some elements of, of, of that. It's inclusive both in terms of people and in terms of the information that goes in there. It's transparent. There's a report that people can see what's the information and what's the rationale going into your decision. And it's given some sort of corporate standardization in terms of the process. And there's a well-documented decision in the end. Thank you very much. Thank you.